Good afternoon. Before we begin the main show, I would like to inform you that I now have a Patreon account. It wasn't my idea, of course, the whole thing seems like a ghastly begging tactic that a man of my stature should not be using. However, as a solid believer in democracy, I am bowing down to the requests of my fans over at my Facebook page. So, if you want to keep me in wine, and perhaps even one day see my videos with adequate lighting, feel free to throw money at me like the upper-class strumpet that I am, and I shall, of course, be suitably grateful for it. If you don't want to part with your pennies, though, then I hear that likes and subscriptions will help my videos get prioritised over social experiments in YouTube searches. So that helps me, and it's free! What more could you ask for? As always, links to my Facebook page and now my Patreon will be in the description of the video. But without further ado, here's a pre-prepared sequence of sounds and pictures about something intelligent for your pleasure. Good afternoon and welcome to Finding the Plot Musings. My name is Sebastian Whittington Smythe. I was playing Never Alone recently and marvelled, pretentiously of course, over the way that the game promoted the Alaskan culture. It is at once a simple 2D platform puzzle game, yet it punctuates every gameplay component and feature with a cultural insight video. These videos explain everything from the character's clothing and the setting, to the reasons for the fox companion, the weapons, the art style and enemies. Basically, if it's in the game, it exists to educate the player about the culture. But it isn't an edutainment game. Instead it's a, and I hate the term, but a proper game that could not exist without its cultural basis, and through playing it I learnt about the Alaskan tribes and culture. It resembles oral tradition, which is essentially the passing of cultural information, history, lore and so on, through the telling of stories. Before writing was a thing, that is how these important details were transmitted to other generations, and Never Alone builds on that by conveying it through a video game. Not as oral tradition, I suppose, but as an interactive tradition. Upper One Games took this step because this Alaskan way of life is dying out. The practical traditions are being diluted by technology, and the myths are being replaced by science. These indigenous people wanted their story to reach the rest of the world, to be remembered. This level of cultural promotion and detail is, and always has been, rare, but at one time games that were drenched in their nation's culture were not. That's not so much the case these days, and so Never Alone made me think, made me look through my games collection to see what modern games actually speak of their developers' culture. There aren't many. But I suppose you're wondering why I care. Well, as a kid I grew up loving video games. That probably doesn't surprise you given the backdrop to my videos, but I grew up mostly loving Japanese video games. They always seemed so alien to me, telling tales of ninjas, magic, gods and little blue robots. All sorts of things that I'd never heard of and I found it spellbinding. Not to mention the settings. The cities and villages looked so similar and yet entirely different. And that food, that strange unusual food, it always looked so pretty and enticing. Which is probably why I grew up to become a shameless addict of Michelin star restaurants and sushi. Growing up, video games made me want to explore the world. And in a sense I did. The 8-bit and 16-bit eras of gaming presented me with games from all over the planet, including the UK, which were the products of individuals or small teams who put their own personal stories and identities into these games, and as such they became examples, stories of their culture. If it wasn't for Mario, I would have no idea what a Tanuki was, or what a Nurikabe is. Nurikabe being walls that impede and misdirect travellers in Japanese folklore, and were the cultural inspiration for Thwomps. Of course, it wasn't just the Japanese games. The British games always had a sense of humour about them, and a Monty Python-esque surrealism, and sometimes they were political. Yes, who would have thought that Manic Minor and Jet Set Willy were scathing satires of the Thatcher years? But they were. You didn't need to know this to enjoy them, but if you were from that cultural background it would speak to you that little bit more. My first ever gaming experience was on the Commodore 64, and the games from the local software houses and individuals were games that I just culturally got, while the Japanese games I played on my Mega Drive and Super Nintendo felt exotic. Of course there are also your American film licenses and sports games, but I never much enjoyed those as a kid. That's not to say they're bad games, but they just never resonated with me in the same way that they do with American audiences, which is kind of the point of this video. But moving on. As games have got bigger, that cultural diversity seems to have slipped away somewhat. Yes, there are still Japanese games that feel Japanese, but what about the Western developers outside of Japan? Where are the authentically French, German, Dutch, Italian, Spanish, Irish, English games? Where are the games that immerse you in Swedish or Nordic culture? In the AAA arena there aren't many at all, because games have got too big, too expensive to create, and so they need to be global. That means gigantic teams of developers and studios spread across the world just to create one single game. It's ironic that in being created by a culturally diverse team of software developers and artists, that the cultural expression of the modern game seems to have been lost in favour of what one could look at as a homogenised global culture. This does make sense though. In linguistics there's something called the lingua franca, the universal language. In business this has become English, but more so linguists have argued that it isn't the Queen's English that I speak, but another sort. 
In Europe, that's Euro-English, which is a form of English understood by non-native speakers. It may sound odd to you or I, lacking the subtleties of our native tongue, but it gets the job done and is understood by all. The same applies to gaming. Gaming has evolved to the stage where the many, many games that get mainstream attention are aiming for the all-important worldwide market, which translates to the American market. Because not only is it the largest one, but due to its ubiquity, the rest of the Western world has been trained to enjoy and get US cultural exports and media. Therefore, every game wishes to be palatable to, and successful within that territory. Games from outside the US are exuding universal Americana, which I'm sure doesn't seem quite authentic to the American consumer, but feels fine to the rest of the world. Granted this isn't just exclusive to games, but media in general. Cultural homogenization is the thing that has been written about by a number of better thinkers than I, such as Gramsci. But moving back specifically to games, just have a think, do you know the development origins of your favourite big blockbuster games? Grand Theft Auto is a pastiche of American culture written by the London-born and raised Hauser Brothers, and was created in Edinburgh among other places. It feels like an American game to my English sensibilities, but when I spoke to Carla Zimonio of the Fulbright Company about this subject, she told me that, as an American, it's not culturally authentic, because the people and the world details do not act that way in real life. From the perspective of an American, it doesn't feel authentic. It's one of those things where you can't explain it unless you're from that culture, where you know that something is wrong. I get it when I'm playing a game that's set in England but hasn't been made by an English person. It could be the way that a room is decorated or a turn of phrase used. You will just know it. Hell, for all their great work of researching to make We Happy Few authentic to 1960s England, Compulsion Games had a character refer to sweets as candy in the E3 2016 trailer for the game. Uncle Jack did a whole show about it. You smash it until all the candy comes out. It happens. It isn't a game breaker, but it can harm the immersion. It certainly did for me. And it's unlikely that an English person would have got it wrong. But I'm getting carried away here. The issue is that we have the Swedish developer DICE making Star Wars Battlefront, a game series based on an American cultural export. Does Assassin's Creed Syndicate feel authentically British? No, it's just an old town with some well-known landmarks, but it feels just like Assassin's Creed, a game designed, developed and produced by a multicultural team of various beliefs, sexual orientations and gender identities. Now, this isn't a completely new development. If you grew up in the early 90s, you will likely remember how many games didn't come out in the West because they were considered too Japanese. Even the first Persona game was whitewashed to remove all traces of its Japanese origins. Every day is great at your Junas. And when researching this video, I came across an interview of Tom Kalinsky, who was the head of Sega of America during the 90s. He saw that the Mega Drive, or Genesis in America, presumably for cultural reasons, was going to flounder unless it took into account the sensibilities of the US gamers. One of his aims was to provide something that the SNES and NES didn't have, and that was American games designed to appeal to an American audience. He got EA on board to focus on releasing sports games such as Madden on the Mega Drive, games that were culturally relevant to that territory. However, back then, most games were still being made by a handful of people. They were small enough in terms of budget, time and scale that they didn't need the whole world to be on board, they just needed to recover the relatively small costs, which was fine for a niche industry. It is that individual touch that means that when you talk of Mario, you talk of Shigeru Miyamoto. When you talk of Sonic, you think of Yuji Naka and Sonic Team. Civilization is the work of Sid Meier, SimCity is Will Wright, Populous is the child of Peter Molyneux. If you saw that the Oliver Twins or the Stampers were making a game, you knew what you were getting. In recent times, I can only think of Cliff Blazinski, Ken Levine and David Jaffe as examples of Western developers tied directly to high-profile, big-budget games. And what do all of these people who I've just mentioned have in common with the exception of Miyamoto? they have all left big-budget game development to focus on smaller personal projects. Back then, the small teams were friends. For example, even during the heyday of Rare, the small team would get drunk at the pub and just chat about what they thought would be funny to put into a game. And that's why Conker has that unmistakably authentic British pub humour. But now, with the committee-designed games from culturally diverse development teams, it means that the culture of the game becomes homogenised. If you want to appeal to the United States, they pitch the game to be recognisable to these people. But if it's made by non-Americans, the game will include well-known touchstones of its culture, but it won't be authentic. Before anybody gets outraged in the comments, culturally diverse development teams aren't a bad thing. Of course they aren't. But just imagine if I was to team up with a German and a Slovakian to try and make a game for Mexico. It'd have luchador masks and burritos and maybe even a donkey. But it'd just look like a parody of their culture to the Mexican audience. It might even end up being offensive. I could never hope to authentically represent a foreign culture as authentically as a native. It cannot be done. Now, you might point to the Japanese games industry as the counterpoint to my argument. Because Japanese games sure do still feel Japanese, yes. 
But at the same time, their industry does still subscribe to a more auteur style of development. Hideo Kojima's name sells, Konami's attempts to remove him from history aside, and if you want confirmation of that, just look at Sony's E3 presentation. Kojima walks out and the arena explodes in applause. And guys like Swery and Suda51 guide their teams with a laser-focused vision. I know what I'm getting with a game helmed by Shinji Mikami, Miyamoto, Eiji Inuma, and I thought Keiji Inafune, but then Mighty Number no. 9 happened. And make the bad guys cry like an anime fan on prom night. Their games are their vision, and their vision, their worldview, their culture is Japanese. The language barrier, isolation, and somewhat insular culture of Japan means that these games are still popular in their home territories. The Xbox and PC gaming haven't really made much inroads because the Japanese have traditionally felt them to be too foreign in their offerings. And so it's perhaps the only development territory that still does AAA culturally authentic games, because they make them for themselves. Yet ironically, Kojima, Swery, and Suda51 are hugely inspired by Western culture. The games, No More Heroes, Metal Gear Solid, and Deadly Premonition, to name but a few, are love letters to Western film and television, filtered through their Japanese perspective, and it's very interesting to see how they create this strange cultural hybrid. Deadly Premonition's protagonist, Francis York Morgan, spends much of the game, which is basically Twin Peaks, talking about movies and drinking coffee in this strange open-world America that just doesn't feel like anything you'd find in a Western game. It plays like a Japanese survival horror game a la Silent Hill, yet features the action of Resident Evil 4 and the open-world questing and car borrowing of GTA, which results in a, shall we say, very Japanese representation of America. As for Suda51, just look at No More Heroes and its Tarantino-style narrative. Seriously, look at No More Heroes and imagine it as a spin-off of Kill Bill and it works great. And then there's his hero, Travis Touchdown, who is visually based on Johnny Knoxville. He's an otaku, loves pro wrestling, drives a bike straight out of Akira, and is a mishmash of cultures, but it's hard for me to imagine such a game originating from a Western mind. It's patronising to call the games weird, because it insinuates there's something inferior about a different worldview, but it is executed far more from a cultural standpoint of a Japanese person than that of a Western person, and thus tells us more about their sensibilities despite trying to appeal to the Western market. And appealing to the Western market is something that Kojima thinks is essential. In an interview of Eurogamer, Kojima said, Game creators now are creating games based on the culture they know, targeted at Japan and Japanese cultures. So they set it in places like Shibuya or Shinjuku, or somewhere else in Tokyo. And it's not something that appeals to people outside of Japan. He espouses the virtues of creating a global game like developers in the West are doing, and spoke of his inspiration from Star Trek and Western cultures. So it seems that Kojima wants Japanese games to stop expressing their innate Japanese-ness, and instead express a global appeal so that the rest of the world will consume them. But in doing so, he neglects a few very important points. The first point is that Kojima is a creator first and foremost. He is also in a position where he has such name value that his creativity sells. He is, therefore, in a position to express his passions through his games. And you know what? His passions are global. And as a result, his games drip with cultural authenticity but that is still a Japanese authenticity. There may well be aspects of Western influence in Kojima's games, but the narratives also contain the sorts of twists and turns, as well as the mixture of magic and technology that means they sit quite comfortably alongside Akira, Gaiva, and any number of anime you care to mention. And then there's their sense of humour. You know what I mean. That pooping guy from Metal Gear 4? The light perversion that's prevalent throughout the series? Yeah, you've got a great butt. Heck, even Metal Gear Solid 4's mechanics were criticised in one review I read for being stubbornly Japanese. So while he may claim that his games are global, it isn't because they are any less Japanese than his contemporaries, but because when he expresses his creativity, it's his natural passion for his hobbies and inspirations that shines through in the final product, and he is fortunate that his interests and inspirations resonate with a global audience. But if one without such passions were to try and mimic his formula, it would likely fail. And if Konami ever does try and make another Metal Gear game, I suspect that I will be proven right. The second point he misses is that not every game developer is in charge of their project. If a publisher were to demand a game that will sell on the global market, they will look, as often they do, at what has been selling and will try and copy that. But a copy of a success is not guaranteed to succeed. Yet other developers do agree with Kojima that they need to focus on the global market. And it's something that Japanese developers and publishers have tried. Capcom, in a bid to appeal to the Western world, offered out their licenses to Western developers. Grin got Bionic Commando with, some would say, disastrous results. Blue Castle, now Capcom Vancouver, took over the Dead Rising franchise, which was more successful. And then there's my local development team from just down the road, Ninja Theory, who got the Devil May Cry franchise, which is still a sore topic for a lot of people. Whereas Platinum Games tried to make something to appeal to the Western market with Vanquish, which tried so hard to be American that it starred Hillary Clinton. 
But as good a game as it was, it wasn't authentically American. It just felt like Japanese guys doing a story of America versus space Russians. But I do hear you asking, why does this really matter? So what if games don't feel authentic to their country of origin? So what if they're trying to be American? American culture isn't inherently bad. And you're right. American culture isn't bad. Without it, the entertainment landscape would be much worse off. And on the flip side, Japan has produced some awful tripe. But the same goes for other cultures too. I want to hear stories, see the creativity of the rest of the world, to be an interactive tourist like I have been with Japan, and to a lesser extent, have with Alaska with Never Alone. And yes, I fully understand the business needs to be global. If possible, I'd love developers to keep doing what they want to do and encourage the consumers to stop being so closed-minded and maybe be more adventurous with their tastes instead of buying things that are iterations of what they've purchased before. But games are expensive and require a time investment that makes it prohibitive to blow your limited personal budget on an unsure bet. But all that being said, it matters for three reasons. One, when a developer makes a game about their culture, their world, it has an authenticity that cannot be imitated. It's interesting, everything from the turns of phrase, the humour, the artistic design is real. Can you imagine Yakuza if it wasn't made by Japanese people? The comedic sections wouldn't involve mob bosses in nappies. The bars and minigames and stories and whole feel of the game wouldn't be as on point. Though I don't think I'll ever forgive Sega for removing the hostess sections of Yakuza 3 for being too Japanese. That Westerners wouldn't get it. As if someone buying a Yakuza game would be adverse to Japanese culture. And what if Bad Fur Day had been made in Germany? Its script would be completely different because of their different cultural sensibilities. If American culture didn't exist, it would never have inspired Kojima to create Metal Gear. Without Zelda and Devil May Cry, there wouldn't be Darksiders and God of War respectively, and I like those games. Cultural expression inspires others to create their own works, and it breeds originality. And it educates. What better way to learn about the worldview, personalities and architecture, and just everything? What better way to learn than to immerse yourself in another culture? But as soon as you try to ape another culture, it can feel forced, and it can go wrong. This is why Konami wanted to keep Metal Gear Rising Revengeance in the hands of a Japanese developer, and gave it to Platinum. It's because they understood the significance of the katana. To the rest of the world, the katana is just a sword, but to the Japanese, it holds a cultural significance that they wanted to retain in the game. And then there's reason two. It keeps games evolving. Games like Akami, Beautiful Joe, Mega Man, Theme Hospital, Elite, A Dog's Life, Gears of War, The Witcher series even, come about because developers are making games that are meaningful to them. They're making games that they want to make, games that they think are cool, that say something about themselves, not games that are engineers to appeal to a specific niche. Gears of War popularised the cover shooter, but it was made because an American developer wanted to do something cool that would make shooting even better. Something you're not likely to see from British, Australian, or even Japanese developers, because our outlook on guns tends to be a little different. And then there's reason three. It's a selfish one, but sometimes it's nice to be able to relate to a game. In TV and movies, I can relate to Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, Red Dwarf, the IT crowd, and the Inbetweeners in a way that I can't relate to Breaking Bad. Although, as an aside, that's a good example of playing to your own culture. Because it couldn't exist if it was made in England, because the NHS would have sorted Walter White out. I mean, yes, as an English gamer, I do fare better than many. The Fable series, rest in peace, was authentic, as was Wipeout, made by clubbers from Liverpool who wanted to make a racing game that appealed to the British clubbing scene. And it worked. Such authenticity reaches further than that, though. My old boss at a previous job bought his son a PlayStation 2 and then heard about The Getaway, made by Team Soho out of London, which featured an accurate recreation of the capital. As it happened, he used to live in London and missed it dearly, so he bought the game and was able to happily mill about his old haunts. He found out that his old shop was in the game, as was his old house. So to unwind after work, for nostalgia's sake, he would drive from his house to his old place of work. And it actually helped to soothe his homesickness quite effectively. But would developers from any other country think to include such an obscure part of London? I doubt it. On the other side of the spectrum, developers who make games about cultures other than their own can have it backfire, with results ranging from immersion-breaking clangers to being downright offensive. The Saboteur was set in France, but made by the Los Angeles-based Pandemic. And it was so inauthentic that Keyes and McDonald stated, I don't think a European studio could have made this game, in an article named Why I Hate the Saboteur for Eurogamer. On the immersion-breaking side, I was excited when I heard that Mass Effect 3 was to have a section in London. I didn't expect it to look like London because it was set in the distant sci-fi future. However, I was surprised to see red telephone boxes. Red telephone boxes placed randomly in alleyways. If you're not aware of why this is odd, it's because the iconic red telephone boxes are placed in easy reach on pavements, not randomly shoved in alleyways as a form of invisible wall. It's small details like this that absolutely destroy immersion. But more seriously, if I was making a game set in Japan or Pakistan, then I'd really throw out some howlers. But that's what happens in game development. There's a famous mistake in Modern Warfare 2 where a map set in Karachi, Pakistan was plastered in Arabic signs. The problem is that Pakistan speaks Urdu. 
Western players may not have noticed this, and I suspect those who did read about it in the press thought, what's the big deal? But to people who call Pakistan home, it's an offensive lack of even the most basic research or care by the development team. And then there's Call of Juarez the cartel, which managed to change the well-known phrase silver or lead to gold or lead, and made such a poor job of getting even the most basic facts right that Extra Credits called it the most racist game they've ever played. But really, it's worth just watching their video on it, so here's an annotation link. Bing. People who don't know about the cultures they're representing can get these things wrong without even knowing about it. It could be using the wrong dialect, or really inaccurate accents, out-of-date cultural rituals. It could be anything. But it also has another side effect. If people keep making the same mistakes, eventually the wider audience believes that it isn't a mistake, but it's actually correct. Which has led to the odd situation wherein we have a British actress, Cara Theobald, portraying a British character, Tracer, in Overwatch, performing a, to some at least, offensively bad stereotypical British accent, when she has a perfectly fine British accent in her own right. Perhaps because that is the voice that the global audience expects. Carla Zimondia spoke to me about the problem of voice actors, that, for instance, in the Witcher series, voice actors for this Polish-inspired setting were mostly cast to be British. Why? Because of marketability. For the American market, it's expected that a medieval setting would feature British voice actors, regardless of where in the world they may be. It's such an entrenched norm that most people may not even notice how odd it is, yet it doesn't really make much sense, except that it might be harder to find Eastern Europeans who are good at voice acting in the English language. But in the original Deus Ex, they did get native voice actors to voice the Chinese or Hong Kong characters in the game. And that resulted in cries of racism, because the audience had got so used to hearing people mimicking a Chinese accent, that when they heard a real Chinese person speaking English, they thought it was actually an offensive stereotype. Mr. J.C. Denton, in the fresh. As dark and serious as his brother. Though the more recent Deus Ex Human Revolution doesn't have the same excuse, considering it managed to butcher the Chinese writing that appeared in the game. And speaking of offence, the other downside of developers including cultures they don't understand is that they can sometimes cause offence without even knowing what or why it's offensive. Nintendo had to withdraw Mario Party 8 from sale in the UK and re-release an edited version, because the US release saw Kamek using the term spastic, which is inoffensive in America, but is hugely offensive in England. The localization team didn't know this, and so when it appeared in an English preview copy and the charity Scope found out, it received widespread bad publicity. On a larger scale, Capcom's treatment of Africa in Resident Evil 5, specifically the fact that so many black people being killed by a white character, caused widespread offence. Funnily enough though, I never saw any Africans asked about this. So when I spoke to Curio Games, the developers of Orion, Legacy of the Koryodan, I had to ask them about it. They have developed their game by using information they got about Africa. We also believe that one of the main goals of a video game is not to copy and paste the reality, but to bring joy and happiness to the gamers. A video game remains first of all a fiction. So there you have it, from the mouth of somebody from Africa, specifically Cameroon, Resident Evil 5 is not racist. Kyo Games is an independent developer who have released a video game called Orion Legacy of the Koryodan. It was created because the CEO, Olivier Madiba, wanted to make a game that would act as a sequel to Final Fantasy VII, but with African inspiration. They told me, During our research on the video game industry, we read some articles reporting about the lack of African games, specifically PC and console games. Because our cultural backgrounds are very rich and various, we thought that a game showing this face of Africa or highlighting our culture could be very interesting. And to that end, they really did their best to design everything to show authentic African culture. From the clothing on the characters to the layout of the villages and the world, it's unmistakably from the African continent. But even beyond the visuals, the trials that the hero Enzo faces and the locations he visits also reflect African tradition. The staff of Curio Games are fans of games from all over the world and relish the opportunity to learn more about the world, saying, We love video games and have played a lot of them, even if they were not African. We think games, especially RPG, adventure, etc., are like books. The player can learn more during his gaming experience. Although Orion is pure fantasy, it is inspired by our environment, houses, clothing and food, and many gamers could learn more. To make our game accessible for everyone, we tell a story that everyone could understand, and we use character with personalities easy to understand. The game talks about what we live every day all over the world, but just in a different way. Moreover, we think the gameplay is the first element that attracts gamers. So, while they do wish to inform the world about their culture, their first concern is still to make a good game, with the gameplay being the most important aspect of all to get right. This is a sentiment shared by the other developers I spoke to, Carl Zimondia from Fulbright Company, and also Whitney Clayton from Compulsion Games, who both echoed that, as important as being accurate is, there are times when reality must take a backseat to gameplay. When speaking about the development of We Happy Few, Whitney Clayton told me, Every detail is crucial to making the world believable. The more cohesive the world, the more immersive and impactful both the story and the gameplay experience will be. If a detail is off, the world isn't believable. 
If the immersion breaks, and not only will the visuals suffer, but the player will be distracted from gameplay and narrative as well. A cohesive art direction should complement and enhance the gameplay and narrative. Having said that, everything must be brought together in a way that will make for the most compelling experience. We exaggerate certain things and tone down others, to both draw attention to things we like and minimise things that aren't so fun. We can't include everything so pick and choose. Certain aspects of culture won't be addressed, both because of time and resource constraints, or because we don't feel it fits with the mood. For example, football is a notoriously huge part of English culture, from winning the World Cup in 1966, but we don't feel that it makes sense in our dystopian world, and implementing football animations or AI would take programming and animation resources that we could use to further gameplay. Cricket though, that works, at least to some extent. On the subject of Gone Home's development, Carla told me that there was a balancing act, because while a home from real life would be authentic in a factual sense, it would not make for a good game. As such, they had to find a way to maintain that authenticity while making the game more entertaining. It's not just a case of write what you know, she told me, but it does help. I was inspired to speak to Carla after I played Gone Home. Despite being set in America, I still recognised the 90s aspect, having grown up in the 90s and recognising such things as the scrawled labels on VHS tapes, and the TV guides to fanzine art and the myriad other small details that really immersed me in the world. These details came from significant research, for instance, visiting the local libraries to browse fanzines and checking published art books and collections to keep the art style authentic. But the details also came from her own memories of how the world was at the time, and from the memories of her parents' preferences for films and TV shows which informed the VHS collection seen in the game. Fulbright wanted to make a simple game as it was just a team of four people and so lacked the necessary resources to make something large and complex. They narrowed down what they could achieve until they settled on the restrictive nature of a house. A house that is larger than one might have lived in in real life, but one that is still accurate to the setting. They chose the story because it was interesting to them and was something that they'd not seen before, and without going into spoilers, it panned out in a very 90s way. While Gone Home was a small project that played to the strengths of the developers, a smallish game world with no character interactions, no character animation, and story told through audio clips and diaries, they were making something that they knew, and in that it was authentic. Their next project, Tacoma, is something of a departure in that sense. It is about six crew members on the space station and chronicles how they keep it running, how they get along and interact. This cast is more diverse, featuring Americans, an Australian and even a Brit. In order to keep it authentic, Carla is pulling on her experience working on previous games, including Bioshock 2 where she ensured that characters, environmental style, music, clothing and even character portraits were sourced or inspired from the correct time periods to make sure that they were plausible, if not one-to-one -one realistic due to the sci-fi setting of the world. Similarly with Tacoma, she tells me that writing for Brits and Australians is different, but she can run her script by people from those countries to ensure that it's as accurate as possible. She believes that this is the only way to be truly authentic, and tells me, You can work with, but you can't escape your perspective. You can't change your own perspective without immersing yourself in the culture. But even then, your perspective won't be the same. Fulbright and Curio Games are both following the method so far of expressing their own culture first and foremost. But the other developer I spoke to, Compulsion Games, is taking a slightly different approach. Their game, We Happy Few, is set specifically within an alternate 1960s England. When asked about the setting, the art director Whitney Clayton told me, Guillaume, our studio head, wanted to make an urban survival game involving social stealth, where everyone is socially pressured to be happy, and you're the only sane person. To support these concepts, I came up with the idea that 60s England could work as a setting. England is seen as a quaint place with a culture of societal expectations, and the 60s was a time of superficial optimism, rejection of the past by obsessing about the future. We didn't realise that we were making something like The Prisoner until Matt, our tech director, pointed it out. None of us had seen the show before, but it ended up being a fantastic reference. From this setting, our narrative director, Alex, came up with our story, which is heavily influenced by British culture, sci-fi and history. The idea of England as quaint is something I see expressed far more in media from other nations than in England's own media, where there seems to be a desire to shed this stereotype and be seen as more gritty. But this certainly illustrates the idea of cultural perception and perspectives being different. If an English developer was making Me Happy Few, they may instead use the fears of a surveillance state to create porcine caricatures of Theresa May and David Cameron, hunting down a liberal student in a poor borough of London. That's not a criticism, but an observation of cultural differences. I asked Clayton about the research they undertook to make sure that the game authentically represents the English setting. Alex, Nick and I do a massive amount of research on the setting, which has included trips to England. I can't speak for Nick, but Alex and I grew up with British culture, especially music, film and television. Each of our generated areas draws on iconic references from various parts of England. Downtown London, the Shambles, or the classic English village. There are certain things we are limited by, gameplay considerations or tech on, for example, very narrow or windy streets. 
But the idea is to provide a setting that ties together all the things we love about British 60s culture. Personally, I'm glad to see developers are taking this step to be accurate and respectful to cultures that they're representing. It is often said that the indie resurgence of recent times has allowed developers to create personal games once more, which was something that seemed to be dying out from the tail end of the 32 and 64-bit eras, as development costs skyrocketed. But the side effect of these personal games being made is that they're culturally distinct again. The personal perspective also speaks of a culture, however subtle it may be. It's a fingerprint that cannot be erased. Coincidentally, as I wrote this, I went onto Steam to see if any relevant games had come out, and on the first page I saw... Maori, a game developed by Cocoa Games out of Salt Lake City. The lead designer is one Sean Kianaya, who grew up in Hawaii and wanted to make a game to educate and inform people about Hawaiian culture in a meaningful way. And there was also Cornerstone Song of Tyrim, which is an action RPG about a young Viking, and it was made by the Swedish Overflow Studios. It's great to see that there are games being made that are trying to express different cultures and perspectives on the world. They may not become bestsellers, and some of the games probably won't even be very good. But if somebody learns something about a new culture or broadens their global outlook, it'll all be worth it. And who knows, one of those little personal games might plant a seed of passion, of interest for another culture in somebody's head, and maybe create the next Hideo Kojima in the process. Or perhaps I've been talking bollocks this whole time.